Today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast is brought to you by Toro Australia and more specifically their new 60 volt revolution professional battery tool lineup. If you're interested in that, more about it later in the podcast. Thank you, Toro Australia. All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. I'm just going to say it straight out. This episode ended up being one of the best lawn masterclasses we've done. We didn't really intend it that way. I just wanted to have a good chat with Kevin because he's a fun bloke to chat with. But he has 30 years experience. He started in 1994, which is the year I was born. Sorry, Kevin, if that makes you feel old. Anyways, his experience is really relevant. And we talk about all sorts of stuff like applying herbicides and fertilizers together. Like what are the pitfalls? Liquid fertilizers with liquid herbicides. Applying synthetic versus granule. Uh, Do the fungi and microbe additives to liquid fertilizers really make that much of a difference? All that kind of stuff. So... If you like this, if you're into that kind of turf care, you're really going to like this podcast. Uh, Really briefly, if you want to support the podcast, jump on the Lawn Shed. These are where all the products are sold that we talk about today. If you get a trade account, there's two things that will happen. One is you support the podcast. Well, when you get the trade account, you say you heard about them through the podcast and that will help the podcast. And the second thing is if you uh, go down that path of the trade account, you actually find more products there than you will just on the normal lawn shed. Also, if you email Ian and you have any specific requests, there's even more products, secret products that Living Turf sells that you can access through there. If you ask him some questions, he'll be able to find you the right stuff. Without further ado, let's get into this podcast with Kevin Booth. All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. I've been trying to get this guy on the podcast for what feels like 35 years. Uh, You've been saying yes, but we haven't got a time. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin Booth. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for finally inviting me. <laughs> hey. <laughs> now, you, uh, we talked for the first time. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. We talked for the first time well before I even had a podcast because I had a question about Barricade. And I called you up and it ended up being what could have probably been a podcast because we think we talked for about 45 minutes an hour about how it works and this and that and it got really technical and I was like, oh, this is a nice guy, super helpful. And then fast forward, I asked you a few more questions over the years just about stuff and then we started a podcast and uh, big thanks to you, you were quite instrumental in getting the launch head on sponsoring the podcast. So um, that's the connection. Um, thanks for that. But why don't you tell people more about your background because you're not just a – uh, well, you are now a sales representative for Living Turf, but that wasn't where you necessarily started. Give a bit of context, and then we're going to talk all things nerdy about lawns and grass and products and everything like that. So what's your story? Yeah. Um, well, Luke, I can go right back. I started in 1994, I think it was. I dropped it, or not dropped out, but left year 10, as you could in those days. Yep. Got an apprenticeship with the local council doing um, greenkeeping. Um, funnily enough, I remember the, the process of that, in how many people actually applied. I think they ran six apprenticeships that year and there was you know, a couple of hundred people for each job. I remember after wow. sitting in the room. With, mate, I remember sitting in an aptitude test with 200 people for the job um, after they'd shortlisted all those jobs. It was crazy. Um, but, yeah, that was four years at the local council doing my apprenticeship. I then got a tradesman position after that and spent more time there, which led into where we were the other day at the Olympic side at Blacktown. Um, so yep. was there during the Olympics doing the baseball, softball, um, did a couple of like landscape home lawn jobs between that. And then about 21 ish years ago, got into repping, um, and had a couple of jobs through different companies to where I am now living turf. So you worked on grass at Olympics. That's a pretty rare thing. Not yeah. many people can say that. No, it's uh, it's a long time ago. It's twenty, well, what, just over twenty four years ago now. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it was a great experience as a young fella. Um, probably know a hell of a lot more now than what I did back then. But mate, we got through it and done a really good job and big days and big hours and produced the goods basically. Yeah, the other thing behind the scenes that people don't know about uh, is that you've helped and worked with Ben Sims from Lawn Tips a lot. And, um, you know, years and years now, and um, he uses you as a, a bit of a help and guiding point at some points in the past, which I guess you're a little bit behind the scenes on that. But, yeah, there you go. People, Some people don't know yeah. that. I like working in the shadows, Luke. Oh, that sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, correct. So, I've, oh, geez, I met Ben as part of my repping run 
when he was on the golf courses in Orange. Um, geez, that would have been probably sort of mid-2010, like mid-2014, 2015, somewhere around there. And then yep. just um, saw Ben's very first video and just said I had a chat to him about it and, you know, the rest is history. So, yeah, good friend and good fella. And, yes, we do, um, through the lawn shed, you know, support a bit of Ben's business, yeah. i got to say, um, just to throw Ben under the bus, if you watch his first videos, <laughs> he has some pretty average facial hair. And if you look at you right now, that's a majestic beard. So you've Mate, definitely... I actually had it trimmed up yesterday just for you. Yeah. <laughs> I got my hair cut um... yesterday for this as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, I haven't had a haircut for 47 years, mate. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't want to throw Ben too far under the bus. Mate, he does about four videos a week. He'll get back at me very quickly. Yeah. He will. But, yes, those early videos, Ben's yeah, you know, fuzzy fluff. And I don't have that good of a beard either, so I really shouldn't <laughs> throw stones in glass house. But uh, you are definitely smashing him on that front. There's no doubt about yeah. it. <laughs> He'll get you back for the stuff upstairs, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, correct. <laughs> So what I wanted to talk about is I think that you've got this really good experience where some people, they they might work. So, you know, what you did at, at Blacktown where you're working at the Olympic site, you know, people might work in a site like that for a long time. But the reality is, is that it's a very niche kind of experience where like it's really cool and really interesting. But a lot of it in sports turf is actually not that relevant to the contractor or to the homeowner. Um, because you know, you're playing with budgets and you, maybe you've got you know, certain products that are no longer available because you're not a professional or you know, they're not for home use or you know, there's certain things on the other side that make it easier for a homeowner and that they're there all the time and you know, applying a product it costs you $2 and you don't have to be that strategic with how you price everything out. Whereas contractors, especially on large scales, they've really got to think about it. And there's, there's all these little one percenters that go into the contractor life and the professional life that sometimes you just need a little bit of a guiding eye or a, or a thought, you know, uh, you know, help someone, someone to help you think through those kind of problems. Because if you were to go by a spreadsheet and you would just go by a, you know, maybe a spec sheet, maybe the product's too expensive, maybe you're not sure it works in your climate, and so someone like you. You've had that huge variety of experiences over a long period of time, over 30 years. And uh, that's why I thought you'd be a great guest on the podcast to chat about that sort of stuff. So how does that sound to you? Yeah, good, mate. The, the thing is, I don't think it matters what uh, position or site you're in. That, you know, Budget's always a concern. Um, I, I personally don't like it when people say things are too expensive. Um, it's like you always talking about your pricing on mowing and hedging and things like that. It's much like us. They're, they're an investment in the contractor world. Um, yeah. you, the, the difference between the contract world and if you call it the professional turf management world is in a contract world, you can get a return on your investment. Um, whereas in the other side, it's, it's, it's a true cost, you know? So um, don't be afraid that a product X is expensive in your eyes if you sit down and work it out as a cost per application to Mrs. Jones' lawn because you'll charge it back. You should be charging it back anyway, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Expensive is relative as well. Correct. You know, because I mean, one thing: what if you use a wrong product and it doesn't do anything? That's probably the most expensive product you're going to use. You applied some of the to zero um, result. Yeah, the poor man pays twice, as they say. Yeah, and then you know, if you make a mistake or something, even worse, because then you got to go fix your mistake. Um, yeah, and that actually brings me into what I was I told you briefly about before. But here's a question that I think a lot of people haven't explored much in the contracting scene is. How do you apply multiple products at once without making mistakes? I had this question the other day where somebody asked, um, this is in Lawman Contracts in Australia. I think they said, oh, I've just put out some, I think they said bow and arrow, uh, but I put out some herbicide and uh, when can I next fertilize? You know, or I'm going to put out some herbicide or something like that. And I commented very briefly and I couldn't be as helpful as I needed to be because I was just, you know, quickly flicking through Facebook. But you can apply fertilizer and some herbicides at exactly the same time, but you also run into some problems if you're a little bit too careless about it, right? Correct. Yeah, look, there's um, there's opportunity there. you just got to make sure, you know, the list is as long as your arm. But are you going to make sure the products are compatible, um, mm -hmm. that you're trying to achieve similar results? Um, and then I would also, depending on what grass you're doing and what time of the year. So if it's a hotter period of year, you've got to be a bit more careful than if it's cooler part of the year. 
Um, if they're, you know, Kaikuyu and Cooch, they're pretty resilient. If it's Buffaloes or, um, you know, Queensland Blue Cooch, you've got to be a bit more careful. But, yeah, there's certainly opportunity to do more than one thing at, at once um, within within reason, you know. Some people get really carried away and try and put 84 products in the tank and wonder why it burnt. But, um, <laughs> you know, yeah, you just got to be careful. Some herbicides are more compatible than others. The one you mentioned, bow and arrow, whether it's bow and arrow or any of the other generic spearhead or whatever, we've found in our experience they're probably one of the least compatible products with a lot of fertilizers. Um, so we've found a product in our range that mixes with it well. Um, and in our experience with spraying, that's pretty much the only product we'll put with it in terms of a fertilizer. Yeah. If you're looking at getting a new battery tool lineup for your business this spring, have a look at the new Toro 60 volt Revolution Professional Series. I recently had the opportunity to head down to the Brisbane headquarters of Toro and I got my hands on some of these tools and I can honestly say there's some really well built tools. The Revolution Series runs off the 60 volt Flex 4 system and it powers a whole range of tools including line trimmer, hedge trimmer, blower and the 21 inch heavy duty 60 volt mower. The line trimmer and the hedge trimmer can be run through the onboard batteries just like you would expect but also through the backpack link which means that if you have large commercial jobs, it lightens the load and makes it a much easier job for you. There are a lot of interesting innovations in this lineup, including a six port multi-charger that you can put on the wall, which is really useful if you're running and relying on a battery system. And like I said, there's a whole lineup of tools ready to go for your business on this platform. So if you want to find out more information, head to the Toro website. There's a link in the description or to your local Toro dealer. Thank you, Toro, for sponsoring this part of the podcast. Yeah, so that's safe end you're talking about there. And Correct, safe ends. Yeah. If you're looking behind me, uh, it's there. So I actually that's use nice it. Pro- yeah, nice product yeah, yeah. placement there. Yeah, it thank is. you. That's genuinely how we stock. I moved. I moved the uh, podcasting <laughs> yeah. table to have it behind me, but the I don't have enough safe end for this application. I only got back from in Perth on the weekend, and then I sort of came back and I was like, oh, we're running along with just about everything." But I've got, as you can see there, some bags of general urea. And tomorrow yep. afternoon, I want you to critique me on this and and tell me what you would do. Um, I'm not going to have hurt feelings or anything like that if anyone's listening, thinking that you're being aggressive or anything. I want to learn, and this is how you learn. So I know roughly what you were talking about. I know that some people have had problems with bow and arrow. So I haven't really tried it uh, too much with stuff. And I'd heard, I think from Ian saying that, like, you know, nitrogen you should be fine and it actually helps the uptake of the of the plant but what would be the difference between me putting some granule urea in the water letting it dissolve and then putting in some um, stadium what is the actual difference with that what risk am i running what applications would i do how would you think about it and and what's the difference with the safe end which we use we just don't have enough for tomorrow's application yeah look with straight urea i think you'll be fine as long as you don't go with too big a rate the best advice on any any product, who is, whoever's it is, is do a, do a jar compatibility test first. The last thing you want to do is mix up, you know, a thousand liters and then it goes to glug in the in the in the container. Right. Um, so just always mix up a little bit in a in a container, um, using you know equal amounts of what you would do on the same scale, if that makes sense. So if you're using you know three hundred liters of water, use three hundred mil of water as a scale. If you're using five liters of product, use five mil. That sort of thing. Right. Um, and then just check the compatibility, um, and that goes with any product. That's the way to, to test. And we do a lot of jar testing in our work when we've got new products. A lot of our products, every company, to be honest, will have a compatibility chart with a lot of the most popular products on the market. Um, it's just that that you got you got to remember in the bow and arrow or any of those other um, similar or you know competitors products um, that there's already three active ingredients in that product. So. That's one of the things you've got to remember. Although you're pouring it as one product, there's already a, a mixture of three products in that or three actives in that tank. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I said, it's it's the urea, I'm pretty confident you'll be fine. Um, but I would still suggest that you double check it in case there's anything silly that doesn't work. You know, water plays a part in it too, believe it or not. Your water's a lot different over there to over here. Um, if someone's using bore water or rainwater, it can be a lot different. So just check the compatibility is the, is the safest thing to do. So if I'm using a – if I'm going down the road and and like a long way down the road, is there a chance that the water is maybe a different acidity or whatever it is? Maybe, you know, um, the, this one's going through new pipes, one's going through old, old pipes and picking up something that's been, yeah. you know, 
can that really play that much of an effect? Yeah, in some products, yes, 100%. So, um, you know, most common product, Roundup, um, if you've got a high, um, Roundup likes being in, a, in an acidic pH. So anything that's higher than, you know, neutral, it, it can break the product down quite quickly. So um, they call it alkaline hydrolysis. And that's why one of the things they say with um, a lot of people add surfactants and pH buffers into their Roundup to get better results. Um, and that goes for a lot of products. Conversely, there's some products that like to work in an alkaline more than an acid. Um, so you yeah, just don't assume that your water is because it's coming out of the tap is always perfect for spraying. Um, sometimes they'll need buffers and you know pH amendments and hard and soft waters, things like that, that might drop some products out of solutions. At you know you're here and you go, you know, 40 minutes up the road and it might be a different water source. Yeah. So so can we test or how? What's the best way to test the water pH? Because you want acidic, right? So what would be a good, if you're talking about Roundup, what would be a good range and how would you test that out? Uh, you can just get as simple as just your pH testers from the pool shops or um, I suppose Bunnings sells them, the litmus paper t- tests um, or the ones you put in the thing. Um, you can buy quite uh, electronic ones now. The yep. guys on golf courses and things like that will actually do laboratory testing on some of the irrigation or spray water. Um, but, yeah, it can be as simple as just a, a litmus test. Um and then basically with, with Roundup, anything that's, you know, seven or less is where its ideal is. A bit more acidic is is better results and more stable is what it's more about is terms right. of uh, the stability of it, that it can be left in a tank for a while. Whereas if you've got a high pH, the half-life breaks down quicker, which basically means it doesn't stay active for as long in the tank um, and will break down in the tank. The water will break down the, break down the active, yeah. So the, if we go back to the, the bow and arrow sort of stadium uh, – because uh, they're, yeah. they're all the same there's product. A, in there's, a, there's a thousand different names of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And there's a new one released actually by Lawn Hub. And I was like, do, do we really need another one? Do we really? <laughs> like, yeah. we had enough already. But anyways, up for them. Uh, but they, you're saying that is really bad or on the worst end of compatibility. Are there other broadleaf it, sprays that are more capable or compatible, I should say, with fertilizers? Yeah, look, at, yeah, there's... Um, um, the thing is, again, in the home market, it's a bit different compared to your contractor world um, and then into the professional turf in terms of golf and things like that. Um, some of them are a lot more uh, stable or, or a lot more compatible, as you said. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, yeah, it just depends like what you're doing, you know. Um, it's just that I said bow and arrow, stadium, spearhead, all the different trade names. It's just one that we've come across. We're just going to be very wary of that we use um, because it can get very messy very quickly if you're not careful um, and you can you can you can lose um, lose its capability basically it's mixing ability any of those three-way uh, products no matter what the brand is you know we obviously only sell a couple of them and use a couple of them but we just found they got to be careful with them we don't like mixing a lot of uh, fertilizers with them um, but you know there is other things other products on the market that are a bit more compatible but it just really a really depends on what you're trying to achieve, you know, um, what, yeah. what weeds you're trying to kill, whether you need the fertilizer at that time or you can do it separate. Um, you know, although it's different scales, your contractors are going and spraying, again, picking on Mrs. Jones's lawn, they probably only want to be yeah. there once as opposed to coming back every day, even though it's only 100 squares, 200 squares, whatever. You know, obviously farmers are in the same boat, but they're doing thousands of hectares. They don't want to be coming back to the shed and filling up um, and – in, in our living turf, we've got a division called Precision Turf, which uh, is all our guys that do the applications, and they're, we're a bit the same. We try to fit as many things in the tank as we can as possible, but to make sure it works without losing the efficacy of any product that we're using um, and without damaging the turf is probably the most important part of that whole yeah. story. Well, what mm. I've found is like it's it's not just the the – like um, how effective it is, it's a return on investment because you can say to a client, okay, I'm going to spray your weeds, right? And let's say, um, we'll talk about which products we can, uh, we'll explore some other products in a minute, but let's say I'm going to spray some some stadium out, some bow and arrow, and I'm going to charge them a hundred bucks, right? If I could mix in a fertilizer with it, I could say, hey, look, I can spray for a hundred bucks or I could put some fertilizer in and we can fertilize it well for say 130. And so usually we charge 80 bucks for a fertilizer application. You know, I'm making these numbers up. So they feel like they're getting a $50 discount. 
because you're yep. charging them one thirty for the, for the double spray. But the reality is, is you know, on a small lawn, you might be putting in three dollars worth of product, and it actually takes you only thirty seconds more to mix it. The spraying time is yep. exactly the same. And I think, and I've been I've been preaching this for a while, is that those combination applications are a, a really good way of making more money and adding more value to the client without having to have that awkward price rise conversation, you know. Do you, do you get what I mean? You know, it's, it's yeah, kind 100%. of, and, and so if you can do that over, you know, four or five different products, um, you know, and you can just add them in, you could end up charging say 210 bucks for a job that you might've normally spent, you know, paid a hundred bucks for, and you got $50 more in product, but you know, you get the idea you're making way more money and it's just a smarter way of doing business. <laughs> Correct. Correct, and the and the thing is, the the biggest input you, normally is your is your time, you know, your yeah. your time and cost, right? Um, the cost of the product again, people see it expensive, but if you actually work out the true input per hundred square meters, it's not actually that huge. Um, might be a couple of bucks here or there. Um, so the cost of the input of the product might only be you know ten, twenty, thirty dollars. The cost to put that out is your labor charge for that hour, um, which I'd say would be more. So. If you can reduce your labor hours for the customer, that's a better investment for them. Um, it also probably makes sure that you'll get the job because you're not quoting them five applications. You're quoting them possibly one application exactly. doing five things. Um, and look, and again, that happens whether it's in small lawns or out to broad acre farming, you know, like the guy that's mixing up 20,000 hectares worth of spray, he doesn't want to keep driving back to the shed to put the next the next spray out next week. Um, and again, for us, when we're doing, you know, big councils or broad acre spraying where you might be doing 50, 60, 100 hectares a week, um, if you can do two or three things in that application um, that are compatible and safe and, you know, within the legalities of it, um, we'll certainly do it, yeah. Um, again, just making sure that they're compatible and that you're not going to lose any of the viability of any of the products by doing that. Um, you know, you don't want to put a, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of an example. Like, you know, it's probably not the best idea to put a leaf applied herbicide um, with a wash-in product or something like that. Um, you can get away with some, but you just got to be careful. And, and again, weigh up the risks of doing it one way or the other. Is it better to do it twice and come back a week after each other? Or is it better to do it one application and, get 90% viability out of each product as opposed to 100% but costing double the input. Um, not double the input, double the application cost, yeah. Yeah. So what about Lonro then? Is Lonro a, a – good? because I like to use that one alongside – they're essentially the two the two post-emergents we're using. We're using Lonro and we're using yep. Stadium. Is that more yep. compatible with things? It, in, in my experience, yes. It seems to be a bit more compatible. Um mainly because, too, that there is sulfur and urea, the formulation of them. Um, sorry, all the sulfur and ureas are a bit more compatible with um, other uh, fertilizers and yeah. other herbicides and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. Um, we did one the other day with some Lonro, and I'm pretty sure that had a bit of fertilizer and a few other products in there to sort of clean up a site that had a few different issues. Yeah. Yeah, because I think um, I think Lonro, the the downside in my experience with Lonro, is one that it's not you can't use it on every type of lawn, especially ryegrass. Yep. Like it's actually there to yep. it, it'll kill ryegrass, yep. and it's a little bit slow. Which so is Stadium yep. to a degree. Like there's other ones that are faster, but do do you find that putting fertilizer with the Lonro speeds up the effect? Because I know that can happen sometimes with some herbicides. Yeah, look, marginally, um, they are just by nature, they're slow to work active active ingredients, right? So um, just because it's slow doesn't mean it's not working. You know, there's an old saying, you know, did it work? And the answer is yes. Like, don't judge that at day two, judge that at two weeks, three weeks. You can only mm. kill a weed once, generally. So whether it kills it quickly or not, and, and you know, colloquially, I would say the products that you generally work slower, slower, generally work better is, is would be the way I'd say it. So the, right. the products that, that um, you know, desiccate the leaf off really quickly and burn, you'll find that the weeds generally come back, um, you know, reasonably quick. Whereas if you have those slow ones that sort of melts the weeds out, um, they work slower, but, you know, they'll they'll generally have a better kill. Um, so, yeah, look, and, and temperature, I'd say, is the big part in that. The growth rate of the plant is – so yep. if you use any of those products you just mentioned – now versus using them in November, 
you'll probably find there's a different speed of, of reaction and, and the kill the kill down time. So so when the what I understand is, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, is that when the lawn is or the so the weed is actually stressed, it doesn't take in the herbicide as well as when it's actually really healthy and growing. It's like the yeah, correct. essentially the juices flowing within the plant. See my technical yeah. you know, description there. Yeah. Um, are flowing more when it's healthy and that transports a lot of the herbicide around better and makes it Correct. more effective. Yep, 100%. Yeah. If the, plant, the, the, the weed needs to be actively growing for most herbicides to work effectively or more effectively. Mm-hmm. If, mm-hmm. if they're under stress, like if the, if the plant's all under heat stress and you know rolled up and there's no leaf surface there to apply it to or it's shutting itself down for, for, um, you know, for moisture stress, well, then the, the product's not going to get in there either. So, yeah, health, a healthy plant or a healthy weed in this situation, you'll get better results generally. Yeah, which is why um, my understanding is that when you apply it with a fertilizer, you get a slightly better result. Correct. That can be part of it. In You know, the old uh, the old farming, they used to always add ammonium sulfate, right, with a lot of their products. And, and a lot of that was, was that, what you mentioned, <laughs> but I also think the the ammonium sulfate buffers the water, buffers the pH, oh, so that's probably another. Right. That's that's another reason. So I think they call it Amos. I think they shorten it to in the ag side of things. Um, and it's yeah, so it can certainly help the weeds grow better, but it also buffers the water. And so get back to what we spoke about at the start, the pH might be more uh, stable for some of those herbicides to work. So one of the things that we do at Silverstein Gardening, and people can probably guess by the products behind us, is I try and actually avoid using blended liquid fertilizers to a certain degree some of them are blended and the reason is that i i like what i like about the products is that i can buy it's like safe n safe k um, enrich which is iron and manganese and i could mix them to my own liking depending on the time Mm -hmm. of the year and what's needed because i believe that yeah, you know, fertilizer programs are ninety percent or eighty percent of what you do, and then the last ten or twenty percent is the human, uh, the gardener's interaction, the gardener's sort of uh, gut feel. Sometimes, okay, I need to put a little bit of extra of this in, or it looks like it's a little bit you know needing in this, and and when you have one product that sort of covers all bases. It's great most of the time, but you know, a little pedantic me sometimes likes modifying those little things. Do you do that a lot? Like, is that what you try and do yeah. with your clients a lot? Yeah. Well, one thing we're big in here, I don't know if, you, if you've come across this, but we, we work on what we call an MLSN, so minimum level of sufficient nutrients. So we'll yep. do soil testing and, and, and recommend based on those soil testing where we can. Um, and if you don't need phosphorus and potassium, we won't recommend phosphorus and potassium. Um, and exactly what you said, people will then blend their own fertilizers a lot of the time based on what they actually truly need um, from what the soil is lacking. What the soil's not providing, they will. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's not an uncommon thing. Um, it's also quite common for us to, you know, another product without talking too much about our products is nourish. You know, guys might spike that with the safe end to get a bit more nitrogen where they need a bit more growth around renos or things like that. Um, yeah. And then conversely through summertime where they don't want as much growth, because you've got natural growth from the growth potential, they'll back off the nitrogen and might increase the K um, for a bit of bit of cell strength and a bit of health that way, you know. So yeah, it's not uncommon. You mentioned, you know, all the products you mentioned are the ones we use in the in the golf and sports fields market as well. So um, they're well, not uncommon brews. What we what we do a lot of is uh, the the number one reason actually why I don't use an iron and nitrogen products together. Uh, and why I split them is because of Kaikuyu. And people complain about Kaikuyu's growth rate and then they will feed it like a granule fertilizer, which is like a, you know, not even a control release or something like that. Yeah. And it gets this Just massive hit of nutrients. Yeah. And then it grows like nuts. And then they're like, oh, I hate working with Kaikuyu. It's like, okay, yeah, I understand it because you can get away with that with buffalo or zoysia, which are much slower growing and cooch, not so much. But, but what we do is like, we will. If we're rocking up to a client's house, say one job is buffalo and the next one is kaikuyu and we're doing liquid applications, it's like the buffalo is getting a higher end rate because you kind of want to encourage a little bit of growth, especially coming into winter or when it's cold. Whereas the kaikuyu, it's like, man, like there's almost no nitrogen we're putting out on that, like as minimum as possible yeah. because you don't want it to grow because then you got to cut it more. And it's kind of like 
that's why I'm like I get I get really pedantic about it, and sometimes I wonder if you know maybe you're getting a little bit too pedantic, and you know it's not making that much of a difference. But there is a big difference between a liquid fertilizer and just throwing on any sort of granule because you're going to get way more content or way more nitrogen out of the granule. And maybe there's a little difference between even just you know twisting them around and all that sort of stuff. Maybe some of these people who are listening to this might start to enjoy Kaikuyu if they're a little bit more. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. The best thing for Kaikuyu is a plant growth regulator, mate. You get plant growth regulator on Kaikuyu and – you can tame it down and do it. But yeah, 100%, if people have got you know big growth, we work on what we call growth potential and growth curves. Um, you know, In the peak of that growth curve, you don't need a lot of fertilizer on Kai Q because it's it's going to be actively growing naturally. Uh, it's probably more about you know holding it back a little bit, putting some regulation on it through Primo or Marvel or whichever one you choose to use um, and just hold it back. And as you say, just l- load amounts of nitrogen and maybe more of the, the ions and things like that just to give it the colour that you might be really trying to, um, you yeah, know, trying to achieve, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's it's different different levels. Um, you know, some of the people you heard on before talk about programming and what level of nitrogen they're trying to put in and that's something that you'd certainly work to um, based on what you're trying to achieve and also um, what type of grass species it is, you know, yeah. Well, I think like sometimes you, and this is why I'm guilty of, sometimes I'm way too uh, nerdy about a lawn that's ultimately just there to look good. You know, like if you are dealing with a sports turf and there's actual stress and like a lot of playing on it, like, yeah, okay, you want to put a lot more effort into it because, you know, there's you're trying to get the ball to roll evenly and the height of cut's actually important and, you know, there's a lot of wear and tear and, it's a bit more complicated, but when you're just like a home lawn and you, the client just wants it green, you know, like you don't – perhaps I overthink it sometimes. And perhaps we do as well. But, um, yeah, there's a, di- there's a difference there, you know? Yeah, yeah, 100%. The biggest thing I'd say on Kai Q too is that everyone expects it to be – I think the thing with Kai Q is because it grows so fast, like people get sick of mowing it, so they hate the grass, whereas if you could mow it more frequently and clip less off it and put a PGR on it, you can actually get some really nice Kai Q. Like, you know, some of the best golf courses are Kai Q fairways and tees. Um, I think one of the best places I saw it was years ago, uh, one of my customers put it down as seed and they had it down to six millimetres as a croquet lawn and it was it was immaculate, wow. you know. Um, yeah. PG, heavy PGR program, obviously, and, and regular mowing, like mowing multiple times a week. But, yeah, you, I don't think it matters what grass you got. You can't have a good lawn or a good surface if you're not mowing it regularly you know and that means more than just like my next door neighbor that mows it once every six months whether it needs it or not you know um it, it yeah. needs to be if you mow it once a week it'll be better if you mow it twice a week if you can mow it three times a week it'll be better again you know um yeah so uh, the, the mowing regime which is hard in your world when you're mowing people's lawns and they're paying for it um i get that exactly but, um you know i, I get that 100 percent. but for people that are looking at their own home lawns yeah plant growth regulators and, and up your cutting regime um, you know, with everything else you do is where you'll get to the next level. Yeah. What do you find with them mixing between fertilizers and wetting agents? Um, yeah. Well, there's, two, there's two things there. One is that like the, the Tricure behind us, which is quite expensive as a product, but we started using that last year and – you get turned off by the price because you're like, oh, you can get cheaper wetting agents. But the thing is you can put it on, it doesn't burn the grass. And one of the things that we were struggling with a lot is needing a lot of wetting agent being in WA, but wanting to do all applications on one hit. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, I I once had this time where I was using a – I don't even remember which brand it was. I was using a wetting agent. This is years ago. And uh, it was a really hot day and it, it was my lunch break and I was working at home and this is my own home lawn. And I had a couple of dry spots and I thought, you know, I'm going to put some wetting agent out and immediately water it in. And I only wanted to water these little spots. So it was two, two areas in my lawn and I got a watering can and I put this uh, product in and I just mixed it and I just put it on the lawn, you know, really quickly, just spread it out. And then I put, got a hose sprinkler and just chucked it on and watered it. And then I put the, the other area and then, you know, five minutes later I came out and I, and I moved it. The other area that had literally five minutes, you know, maybe 10 minutes got burnt because it was hot. Yeah. 
it was the middle of the day and you could see the lines. You know how like the watering can like, comes uh, through the droplets? Yeah, you could see at the edges of where I had just been swirling around. You could see lines of burn immediately. Yeah. In, and that made me really nervous after that to use wetting agents with your fertilizer applications because you want to leave, for the most part, your liquid fertilizers on the leaf for four hours or something like that. And then you want to put your wetting agent down and water it immediately. And they don't, you know, that don't, that's, yeah, don't work. That gets yeah, back work. to what I was saying before, where you have to make sure that they're comp- not only compatibility in terms of physically compatible, but whether they're compatible in the methodology. Um, and yeah, look, wetting agents, yeah, how do you put it? The old oils ain't oils type syndrome, you know, they don't, don't put them all in the one band. There's lots of different technologies in those and, Generally, the cheaper ones are cheaper for a reason and the more expensive ones are more expensive for a reason and it's technology a lot of the time. Um, but, yeah, and, and it's hard not to do it, but putting wedding agents out in the middle of the day, no matter of the product, is probably not the most ideal way to do them. Um, but we realise that you have to. And, yeah, you're right, That's Tricure old, is one yeah. of the few. Yeah, Tricure is one of the ones that you can put out, leave it on the leaf. Um, and the other thing that's quite interesting is from what we've been told from independent testing is that it's one of the only products that when left on the leaf doesn't lose any of its efficiency when it is washed in. Some of them degrade a lot by sitting on the surface. So um, whether you wash it in straight away, ideally any product you could wash in ideally um, straight away would be perfect. But if you can't, you can be rest assured that one, it won't burn and two, that you won't lose any of its efficacy um, once it is washed in. Um, And look, we've got guys on golf courses that use it on, you know, bent grass greens at two millimetres and leave it on to that night before they water it in and it's safe you know yeah so it's a it's a good product and just be careful what you mix with it again like um you know if you're mixing fertilizers with wetting agents that probably <laughs> heightens the heightens the risk of um of issues um again but using good you know good fertilizers and good wetting agents um can lower that risk yeah so there is what do you what do you feel when people are like, oh well, a surfactant, a wetting agent in that category, they're all kind of the same thing. Yeah, because you hear that a lot, and especially in the home garden, where they're like, I oh, just put some detergent down. Put some detergent with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the yep. actual truth about that statement? <laughs> are detergents the, the, the same as yeah. wetting agents? Well, there's a saying, and I'll get this wrong for sure, but it's something along the lines like, all soaps are wetting agents but not all not all sorry all soaps are surfactants but not all surfactants are wetting agents um so what they're basically saying in the family yes they are in a surfactant family but they're different surfactants right so you know they're designed to have um you know cutting for grease and things like that when you're washing up to get through the grime whereas we don't need that and a lot of those products is what can be the burning effect on grass um you know one of the biggest things you want to test is that it doesn't burn or have any phytotoxicity effect on grass. So if you went and put out, you know, not being rude to Dawn or, you know, any of the other soaps that you got under your kitchen sink, if yeah. you went and put them out on your lawn in a watering can like you did and left them on the leaf on a, on a warm day, they will, they will smoke your grass, you know. Um, right. So, yeah, they are technically surfactants, but they're a different grouping, I guess, of surfactants for that purpose, right, to be degreasers and all that sort of um, thing and biodegradable and all that, whereas ours are in a surfactant. You know, conversely, I wouldn't tell someone to go and use Tricure to wash up their dishes, you know. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, that's that's the way you What do you look mean? That's, it, another, right? that's another income yeah. stream for you. What are yeah. you talking about? This is a great yeah. this is just, way to make more money. <laughs> you know, effectively, the ones you, you know, the products you use to wash your cars and trucks, they're effectively surfactants too. Um, but again, you wouldn't go and wash your dishes with, you know, a truck wash or you wouldn't put that on your lawn. So just just be wary um, that, you know, there's a reason being. And a lot of people will say, oh, you know, product A burnt my lawn when I put it out. It's, you know, you got to be pretty sure of yourself. You know, there's a thing that we sort of say 95% of complaints are usually 95% of the operator. Um, so <laughs> it's uh, it's very rarely the actual product. Um, when you get down to the nitty gritty and you ask people questions and what rates and what nozzles and what did they do before and after, usually you'll find a, a problem there that has created that issue. Um, you know, so... Yeah, don't don't always blame the products, particularly if you're using, you know, if you're going to spend the money on buying good products like Lonro and all those products we've already mentioned, you know, make sure you're spending the money on buying a proper surfactant to go with them. 
they're so cheap anyway. Like the input of those, like you buy a one liter of any of the surfactants, <laughs> yeah. and they'll last. They'll last you for, you know, they'll last you for for years. So, um, you know, there's really I'm- no excuse in my. Up there, I think I've got twenty liters. Where is it? There it is. Of uh, where the six hundred, the labels turn because yep. the taps on the side, and uh, that's not a product that you sell because I bought it about four years ago, and I think I'm about yep. a liter and a half into my twenty liter. That's what I'm bottle. saying. Like, <laughs> the product we we use a product, and I think we put it out at about two hundred mil per hectare. You know, so yeah, you know, exactly. you, a one liter can take one liter will last you for five hectares, which in a home lawn situation or commercial you know lawn mowing situation will last you for a number of years and it's you know you're probably paying there's certainly less than 100 bucks probably less than 75 bucks for a one liter container so that's very low input cost um, which yeah. is why i question you know why would you use your dishwashing liquid un- under the under the sink basically yeah for that kind of stuff the other thing i wonder about with with dishwasher liquids is like because they've got colors in them and they've got fragrances in them and things like that and yeah, you might – maybe if you distilled it down to just its basic compound, maybe, you know, it's quite similar. But at the end of the day, they're actually not that similar to – yeah, as a whole product, there's a lot of other things added to it. So yeah, I wonder what, they, what yeah, effect they of, have. Yeah, correct. That's right. So it could uh, – on, on the floor and the soil and things like that. But, you know, you got to remember these products don't just get pulled off a – you know, just get pulled out of a shelf and decan them and put them in and go, there's just a factant. Like, it doesn't matter whose brand it is. There's years and years of research and testing on these products to, to find a product that's going to do what it says it's going to do and, and do it well, right? So I've been lucky enough in my time to be to a couple of these factories and if you sort of saw them, they, you know, they'll have six and seven lab rats there testing products, you know, to make a wedding agent. Like, it's um, it's it's quite scary the amount of work that goes into a lot of these products to get them to, to market. And, and I guess from my point of view is why you then, you know, get a bit offended when you hear people say, I'll put a bit more and it's better or a bit less or do this or do that. Like you've got a guy that's a keyboard warrior effectively making recommendations over someone that spent 10 years of research to, to build a product and find out the way it works best. Yeah. People become suspicious because they've been ripped off by a salesman in the past or they've heard about people being ripped off by a salesman and they always go, oh, well, you're just trying to make more money or whatever it is. And look, sometimes there's some dodgy people out there, but often the time is in this industry, especially a, a you know, when you have someone like yourself who's an ex-professional, whatever business they work for, you know, you know they got into the industry because they liked grass being green and they liked plants being healthy and and then they just got into the sales side because it was a good job where they could help people have green grass and all that sort of stuff and certain people i I don't know what each business is like they don't even make more money the more product they sell they're just on a on a wage you know they're just you know it's it's, but people are like a used car salesman is the classic example they're like oh is this another guy who's telling me it's the greatest thing since sliced bread but they're just making more money off it you know the thing i'd say to that luke is that it's a very small trade, and it's a very incestuous trade, um, and it's probably it's probably more uh, it's probably got smaller with you know social media and, and connectivity. Um, so, you know, if you're out there doing the wrong thing, you don't last very long in this industry. Um, and the thing against car salesmen compared to someone like myself is that I've been seeing the same bunch of customers for twenty two years on you know on a monthly, if not more frequent cycle. The thing I'd say of a used car salesman, not being rude to them. You'll see them once when you buy a car and that's it. They don't care about the repercussions. Whereas for us, if it's not successful when I see you this month, you're going to stick it to me the month after. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. My, 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 my interest is getting you the result first and foremost and then finding the product that gets you that result. So we're talking about the difference between wedding agents. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, and I don't know how much you – or how deeply you can answer this question because I know you've, you've passed me on to details of some people at, at Living Turf before in the past about this because it gets really nerdy and technical. And but if you look me. at – Not that nerdy and technical? No. <laughs> no. Um, how to grow a beard. i glasses um, here. Should I put glasses <laughs> on? Does it make me look smarter? You must put them on for this section of the podcast, <laughs> right? Because we're, yeah. we're getting nerdy here. The question that I have for you is – I've not. I have noticed some difference with the cheap, uh, say, liquid iron products, which are, from my understanding, yep. literally just um, like a, a powdered iron product that is then just put into water, 
at, at a basic level. Am I right with that? At the cheapest level of the liquid iron products? Yeah, look, so, so what you're saying is that are you talking the variants of different products in that, like in yeah, iron, the, for example? The point I'm trying to get across is if someone's gone to buy a product, they go liquid iron. There's like 700 yep. varieties of liquid iron across yep. 40 brands and all at different yep. price points. And what people often will just do, they'll just go, oh, well, this one seems in the middle. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to get the yep. cheapest thing. And they'll go, well, this one's more expensive. What is the difference between them? And I know that the answer with Living Turf stuff is that the one that we use has got microbes in it. Right, That's the general answer. But what does that really mean on a practical basis? What are you actually getting when you're buying a product that's got a higher price point when there's all these other ones that are really basic out there? Yeah, the um, look, it probably goes beyond just iron, right? So the more, the more technical the product is or the bigger the technicality of the formulation, um, obviously there's a cost in that. It's like a prill. If you get a big prill versus a small prill, the small prill takes more technology to get to that point, so it's generally more expensive. In the terms of um, iron, iron's a pretty easy one because you can start with sulfate of iron, cheapest formulation, you know, mm-hmm. 25 bucks a bag, whatever it is. Um, it'll work 100%, but it'll also smoke your grass pretty quick too, right? So the risk is that you can um, use it and use it well. and It's used quite widely because it's cheap, um, but you just got to be careful that, you know, your lawn can go black and you can stain your... In a home lawn situation, the sulfate of iron will stain concrete and fence lines and brickwork and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's probably one thing. It'll work. Um, and then you get to products. So we have those products. We're not hiding. You know, We have um, uh, Enhance and Brilliance in that sort of product range that are, that are made on sulfates. And then the product that I think you use, well, I hope you're using because that's what we spoke about is Enrich. Um, yeah, that's behind me yeah, too. Right? Yeah, cool. So... It, it, it works on, and like a lot of other products in the market, they have like chelation formulations of iron. So they're a softer form. Um, they're more technical, um, technically pure. So there's a higher concentration of the iron. Um, they're generally softer on the plant. Um, obviously, they're more expensive because of the production costs. Um, they can be less burning. They can be more compatible. So there's a reason why they're, you know, you know I guess it's like, it's I guess it's why is a Ferrari $300,000 and a, I don't even know they make them anymore. Holden Barina, twenty six thousand dollars. They're both cars, you know. Mm. But there's there's variants in them, right? Um, so yeah, look, the Enrich is a great product because it doesn't burn. Um, it's got microbes in, it, as you said. It's and, and just the formulation of the product in there. Um, and the other big thing is it doesn't stain. So that's the biggest thing that I like with it is it won't stain yeah. your concrete and uh, and and things around. Um, so just, yeah, it's just a matter of being, um, you know, if you're going to go and spray a sports field and do two hectares. By all means, you might be happy with sulfate of iron. Um, you know, we've all had the experience where people have gone a bit too hard and got the burn, the big black burn from the sulfate of iron. Yeah, um, I've done that for sure. That, yeah, that that's that's a risk of it. Um, so it's just about dialing it in. And you know, to me, in a home, if you're charging someone to do it, you don't want that to happen when you're applying it. Um, so just again, it's just all formulations, being aware, reading. You know, as the law states on a lot of things, is read the label. It'll tell you a lot about what's in the product and. And why that cost of um, you know, and again, the word expensive is is you know correct, but there's a reason for the expense. And again, you know, it's the old uh, the poor man buys twice in something, and sometimes you got to pay more to get the better products mm. uh, based on formulations. Is this your experience as well? Because this might be my just you know subconscious playing with itself sometimes. You know, like you, you are convincing yourself of something. But when I apply Enrich, I find that it looks it looks slightly different. The result looks slightly different. Like there's kind of like a different the the cheaper. Um, what's the word? The cheaper iron products maybe a little bit more brownie in the grass, like uh, the grass. Yeah. And and the and rich is maybe bit. yeah maybe a little bit more bluey in the green. Yeah. Um, is that just me? Well, it could be. It, it, it could be. I can't say I've <laughs> yep. looked at them that that side by side to notice. Like generally in our programs, we'll use um, the enrich as a as a monthly program. So we're never really going in for that you know that big bang, if you know what I mean. Like that that big bang of color. Um, it'll just be a yep. maintenance type product. Um, but in saying that, we would use that and then like if I'm working with a, a ground that might have a you know an A-League or an NRL game or something like that, they might use the sulfate of iron type products to give it that that 
intense green um, the three or four days out from the event. So there's no reason not to use both products or all products. It's just a matter of picking what you want to do, um, you know. But in terms of in in safety, plant safety, enriches be some, I, I'd much rather use enrich over our own enhance and brilliance, you know. Um, if there's potential to cause damage or stress, um, and just in maintenance, um, you know, the enrich is just a good product to put in with the zinc and the manganese in it as well, um, and the carbohydrates and all the goodies um, in it as well. It's a it's a good product. But yeah, in terms of different colours. Yeah, I guess it's all, it's all perspective. It's all perspective yeah, too, right? Like we go through this with pigments. You know, what I like is different to what you like is different to like someone else's. Yeah. You know, they're all it's it's you know I, I have this expression quite often. It's holding and forward. Like if you like if you like using pro- someone's products and they're doing what you want, great. But there's others that like ours as well, and you'll probably never convince them. Vice versa, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Pe- people don't like being um, told that what they're doing is not right. So if they if it's working for them, stick with it. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd say suggest is you give products a try that you've never tried before, um, because that's where you'll you'll learn and um, and and might see benefits or ease of applications or cost benefits. Um, you know, um, things are said like, mate, one of the best things I've. I had it at my place, you know, everything that was, was yellow, you know, the concrete, the, the fence, the power pole out the front, and it's all from the sulfate of iron that was in products, you know. Um, yeah. Um, and, the, and the product I was, was using, I was I liked the product, but it just – I got sick of cleaning the fence with all the iron, you know. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think one of the most underrated things that people do, like in as a contractor, you feel pressured to give discounts to people. And I actually feel, and we talk about this in the course, right? It's like never discount, but feel free to give things away for free for people. And one of the yep. best opportunities that you have is to trial products on clients' lawns for free. And so if you are like, oh, I'm going to you know, take whatever product, but we're just talking about a rich, um, whatever brand, who, you know, whatever someone feels comfortable with. But let's say you're going to buy a new product that's a bit more expensive and they have like a one liter version of it. And your lawn looks fine, so you don't need to apply it on your lawn. But you're like, oh, should I try it out? And you're like, you know, this, you know, Mrs. Jones, she's a nice lady. She's never going to be able to afford to do this. You know, she's she's cutting corners to make ends meet. Why don't we just give her a trial run of this and say, hey, Mrs. Jones, we've got this huge product. We're just going to put it on your lawn for free. See how it goes. She'd be over the moon, and she'll tell her friends about it. It's a great opportunity, yep. and it's cost you thirty bucks, you know, or something like that, because you put a product out, whatever it is. But you go, do you know what? Like to me, that's a you're, from a business standpoint, just a sales standpoint. You're going to get way more good word of mouth from something like that than you would ever get from giving a thirty dollars discount once off to somebody. Do you know what I mean? Like a free service like that. And I think, you know, we've done that so many times when we're trialing a product, you know, especially before we had the packages, just trialing stuff out to just see how it goes and not charging because you don't know if it's going to work that well or not. Yeah, the other thing I'd say too is once you give a customer a discount, they expect it all the time. Um, So, yeah, I guess conversely, they probably expect free product all the time, but you know, one of my customers I deal with that does do home lawns around me, one of his big tricks is he, he – I'll probably get this wrong, but I think he fertilizes everybody's front lawn for free. Um, he pays for the cost of the fertilizer, which on 100 square meters, 200 square meters is probably, you know, probably less than $10. Um, and then what it does for him is it gets the – Maybe, or the people see the result and then want the backyard done. So then he charges for the backyard done. But what he also does is it works out he gets a couple extra cuts on his cut cycle for the year because he's fertilized the front lawn. So his $10 investment, you know, he's got it worked out. It gets him an extra three cuts, for example. So it pays for itself in that, you know, swings and merry-go-rounds um, that, yeah, it helps him out. Um, so, yes, yeah, so certainly trial things, put things side by side, give them, you know, if, if you're not – 100% on what you're using, put something else up against it, give it a trial, muck around with rates, you know, like it's, um, it's you got to find your own sort of niche, as I said. Um, the other thing too with, um, you know, if you've got a Mrs. Jones again and she's got a party coming up and you're charging her, it's a bit harder in that world because they expect to see a result the day after you've gone, um, if you know what I mean. So those mm-hmm. sugar hit those sugar hit products urea and sulfate of ammonia and exactly. you know sulfate of iron and things like that I, I wouldn't walk away from them on your first up clients because they want to see a result when you're charging them a hundred dollars or whatever it is 
Um, yeah. Whereas if it's an ongoing, you know, the beauty of your business is you are having a programmed approach. So they don't want to see, they want to see consistency through the year as opposed to where you just go in and give them one fertilizer a year and they want to see the big bang for your buck. So, you know, the programmed approach is, is a very good methodology where you can use, you know, probably better products and more consistent products, less risk products. Um, but yes, they do probably cost a bit more um, and, and, you know, build soil health and all that sort of thing as well, more so than just sugar sugar hits to the grass and getting them growing. Mm. And But you're right, the sugar hits are valuable for that turnaround phase. Yeah when you've got a lawn that's not so good, which is why we have urea behind us, right? Yeah. Like we might we might do a lawn where we are putting down, say, you, you, the program's got a slow release or control release fertilizer in it, but you know it's still really hungry and you're like, you know, I'm going to put a little bit of extra urea in there because it'll give me a couple of weeks of extra boost and yeah. it's not going to thatch. We're not talking about crazy amounts that'll thatch the heck out of it because it's pretty sparse. Uh, sparse. That's what I'm looking for. It's pretty sparse, and <laughs> you know, it's got to it's got to fill in a little bit more. So you can do that, and you can just chuck a little bit extra on, and and yeah, that's what we talked about back at the beginning about having multiple different products that you can mix together and customize it to each yeah. individual lawn. Yeah. Yeah, even your slow releases. If you look at a lot of your slow releases, they'll still have a component of upfront. Yeah, you know, upfront availability. So, you know, you buy a product that's sixty percent slow release nitrogen, so it's effectively still got forty percent upfront. So, if you read the again, read the label, read the analysis sheet, you'll find it's you know a certain amount of it's sulfur coated or poly coated or you know carbon coated or methyl and urea, whatever form it is, and then it'll yeah. have a urea or an ammonium upfront, um, which gives you that that initial hit. Um, and then obviously you've got the things like what you said, the, the ureas and that that are all up front. Um, and we're not saying don't use them, just be, you know, you wouldn't put that out in the middle of, you know, middle of, uh, middle of the growing season because you'll just be chasing your tail and get a sugar hit. But you might use it now coming out of renovation where you want that big hit of growth to, to you know, to cover the grass back up. Um, so, yeah, just picking your products and again and experimenting with products and maybe not using the one product all through the year. There's different things you might use at different times of the year depending on what's required. Going back to the nerdy stuff we started touching on before, we started talking about soil microbes and, you know, the – is it VM3 and VAM that are yeah, yeah, in yeah, yeah. products? Food sources, yeah. So what what do they actually do? Because I know it's one of those things where it's like, is it just a marketing term? And I know it isn't, right, because I've, I've yeah. read stuff, but I still don't really understand exactly what it does. You're like, ah, oh, kind of helps with this and that. But I guess people are suspicious sometimes of the salesy, fancy words that, you know, like, you know, a great example is vegan leather. It's plastic. <laughs> yeah. Vegan yeah, leather is yeah. just plastic. You know what I mean? Yeah. But why people are, are like, oh. Them, <laughs> yeah, why do they call them like veg- vegetarian sausages and vegan sausages? Like, it's not a sausage. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, but yeah, but the whole idea of. We used to have vinyl seats that you used to have yep. in your car, you know, or plastic yep. seats, and that now it's vegan leather. And it's like, <laughs> oh, the great marketing term, but we all know what it is. Come on. And is there, is yeah, there a bit of that? Sort of, and I felt that, that, um, that suspicion myself sometimes with the idea of, ah, oh, these products. And they say, oh, it works on the soil and blah, blah. So like, do you have – well, what is the idea behind the VAM and the VM3 and all that fancy stuff? Yeah, so the VAM is is mycorrhizae, so beneficial mycorrhizae. So it's a fungi that gets into the soil. Mm-hmm. And basically what it does is just improves the mycorrhiza of the soil and, and it actually provides it. Um, so it's a, it's a source that gets in there to boost all that. And then in turn, they break down, uh, break down organic matter and uh, mineralize the fertilizer in the soil and makes it all work. And the VM3 is basically just a proprietary um, technology uh, of to help provide that nutrient availability to the plant. So most of the um, most of the uh, superior liquid products you have have at least one or the other, and most of them have both in the in in there. Um, and they're just yeah beneficial fungi and um, in, in mycorrhiza to to improve the soil microbe. Yeah, I'm googling mycorrhizal fungal. Oh, funny. Yeah, yeah. Don't um, uh, don't tell me a liar. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to um, uh, mycorrhiza. I always, uh, look. I here's a definition: uh, a beneficial fungi growing in association with plant roots and exists by taking sugars from plants in exchange for moisture and nutrients gathered 
from the soil by the fungal strands. Mycorrhizas greatly increase the absorptive area of the plant, acting as an extension to the root system. And that's uh, from the Royal Horticultural Society in the England. The England. <laughs> the motherland. The England. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say the UK, but then I was like, I don't, maybe it is the UK. Anyways. Uh, but, so there you go. So that's what they are. Yeah. So Beneficial and, fungi and that a, help the plant take up yeah. nutrients. It's the interface. It's, it's right at the end of the root tips, basically, that of, of any plant where the interface between the soil and the root is. It just uh, increases that, um, you know, surface area, I suppose, and helps the plant take in exactly what you said, moisture and elements and food and all that sort of thing. Um, and then it works in exchange between the plant and the soil and the way they interact. Um, and as I said, a lot of them, you, you know, you'll see things like um, biological boosted or biological improvement and all that sort of stuff. Again, some of it can be marketing, but in you know, in our particular products, it is it is there. Um, it, it can be tested and proven that they are there. Um, and funnily enough, you can do testing in your soil to test um, to test your percentages and uh, their functionality in the soil of different micro um, micro microbial activities in your soil. So you can sort of um, what's the word quantify it as well. Yeah, right. So you could measure over time how much. So that answers the kind of skepticism to a certain degree. If you could measure how much increase is actually happening because of the product application. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So we do um, it, it testing on certain facilities that will test that, um, and they'll test at different times of the year to see how their microbial activity is going in their soil. Um, and interestingly, the most damaging thing to a healthy soil is synthetic fertilizers. So the overuse of synthetic yeah. fertilizers, I should say. So um, a lot of people think it's fungicides or herbicides or insecticides. It's actually synthetic fertilizers. Um, and, um, you know, that's why you just got to be careful on how, how and when you use them. Um, and then that's why we push a lot of the, 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 the microbial in, uh, boosted products and the VAMs, VA, VM3s to help build that biology back up in your soil and what we call regenerative turf management, you know. Um, and if you go to farming, funnily enough, farming's now into that. They've oh, gone 100%. past the words, they've gone past sustainable and they're into the regenerative form now um, because they've realised that over the years what they did was degraded the land basically. Um, so now they yeah. realise that biology is the, the key to everything. Um, you get the biology boosted, you'll get your ground back up, yeah. So... This might seem like a stupid question, but if the synthetic fertilizers are killing the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, I'm assuming that the fertilizers that include the mycorrhizal fungi themselves are not synthetic. Yeah, that's right. We try to be range? as natural as possible. Yeah, as natural as possible. Um, you know, look, there still is some elements in there, but yeah, you'll find they're based on rocks, phosphates, and you know, softer forms of protein, nitrogens, and things more than ureas and, and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. You've got to be very careful in the formulations as well. Um, a lot of them, sure. um, some of our, you know, and that goes again for anyone's range. Yeah. So if you um, if you've yeah. got, so my safe N has mycorrhizal fungi in it, doesn't it? Yeah, it's it's also a pro, it. uh, yeah, and it's a protein. Uh, it's a protein based nitrogen as well, so um, it's compatible right. and it's it, it won't it won't be detrimental. Any of any of those. Superior liquids, as we call them in our range, are that way inclined. If that makes sense, um, yeah. So, yep. and a lot of that, a lot of that range now has got um, oh, organic certification. You know, or, or organic um, certification inputs. Um, so, there's I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but I know there's a few of them. Vitalize, uh, Kelp Plus. Trying to think which other ones. I think Foundation. Yeah. Uh, anyway, a couple of others that are uh, that are uh, certified organic inputs, yeah. So my question on a technical level about Safe N is my understanding is urea is one of the worst, if not potentially the worst. Like just straight nitrogen is some real bad stuff for killing the fungi in the soil or for yeah, damaging I, the fungi in the yeah. soil. You, you could be 100%. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I just know that synthetic-based fertilizers are what can be damaging to uh, the microbe in the soil. Um, and it's it's more the overuse. Like doing it once is not going to be you know detrimental. Okay. But in in farming, you know where they use the same product. And the old story goes, you know, you put out two hundred kilos of urea, got great results. 
Next time you put out 200 kilos, it worked okay. The next time you put 300 kilos out, you didn't get the same result. They just kept upping the rate, upping the rate, upping the rate. Yeah. And the reason being is that the, the microbial activity in the in the soil was barren, you know. Um, yeah. So it could it couldn't break that product down. Once they um, get the microbes back up, you'll get results again. So um, as I said, don't. We're not saying don't use them. Just be careful where you, when and where you use them, and be aware that it does have some degradation to your soil over time. Um, and you can you can you know regenerate that, which is where farming in, in our business certainly is is regenerative uh, turf management in terms of building that back up, getting a healthy soil so that you get a healthy plant from there. Um, well, and you, you know you'll see it. I uh, maybe six months ago I did a podcast at a like a compost manufacturing yep. facility. Yeah, and yeah, another one. Yeah. Um, Greg, after we recorded the CEO of that business, he showed me some photos, which would have been great to have had in the podcast of a farm down south from here. And and WA soils are rubbish. WA soils are really low quality. And so they have had a lot of fertilized inputs. But this farm, which is a huge farm, did a trial spot last year with um, their compost. And they spread it at three different rates. And I think it was about an acre or something like that, each trial spot. And they were doing all the maths on it to go, okay, what would the cost of the application be and what was the return on investment? And you had these three photos of the low, medium, the high application rate of the compost over the soil. And you could see there was a massive increase in growth. And what they worked out is that they actually, the costs are way through the roof compared to fertilizing, but the return on investment was enough to justify the use, if not make it more profitable. I don't want to overstate the argument here because I'm just going yeah. memory. But what he did tell me is that farm decided to go full compost next year. So because yeah, wow. of the trial spots. So they were going from essentially, you know, full synthetic fertilizing, if I'm understanding correctly, to the other extreme. And they believe that that's going to be, even though way more expensive, is going to be better for them in the long term. That's their way of the future. Yeah, look, it's it's one of those things. You, you got to have a bit of interest in it and a bit of uh, you know, bit of reading about it. Um, and I said, it's if you put them side by side, you're never going to see that instant effect. So anyone that's after that instant gratitude, you're probably not going to see it. But mm. over time, um, you'll certainly see the benefits of building healthy soil. Um, interestingly enough. One of our granular fertilizers is also, I think you use it as well, um, some of our biological boosted um, in the Eco Advanced range. Do you use Origin or Spectrum at all, any of those products? Or, yeah, there's Granules? a little bit of Origin behind me, I think. Yeah, yeah. so they're, they're, um, they're also microbially boosted um, with the Eco Advance, you know, trademark product. Um, and interestingly enough, there's a photo somewhere within our, our internal stuff where one of our reps left it in the back of his car and it rained and, you know, got wet in the back of his car. And you could see the hyphae growing across the back of his canopy um, in the car that come out of the fertilizer um, from the beneficial microbes. So it was quite an interesting oh. photo that over over a weekend in you know in a warm weather with a bit of moisture um, that the microbes and the beneficial hyphae started growing through the back of his car. Yeah. Do you um, know what? I've so, had I've had a little bit of that because if you look up there, if I can bend this back far enough, I've got my um, plants at the top. Oh, these are the there? plants I always hear about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not doing very well because um, <laughs> my cheap tap timer um, went to be with the Lord when I was yeah. on holiday. And I don't know when, but some plants, I came back and they were fine and some plants were like, I need water. And so yeah. it must have been fairly recently. But I had a leak above there and the water got down onto the fertilizer at the back and I had the same... I had a yeah, similar thing exactly. where I had some pretty interesting patterns coming out the back of some of those fertilizer yeah, yeah. packets. No, that's that's what it would be. That would be the microbes yeah, that's, biology. That bag there is all we have left of origin. Yeah. I've come back yeah. and this is like honestly as low stocked as I think this has been for like a year because I've been on holiday. Right. Most of those bottles at the top, that that like yeah, because you can't see inside them, they're like almost empty. <laughs> it's yeah, like well. hardly, hardly any product left. I think TriQ is completely empty there. <laughs> I look forward to I, I look forward to your e to your email with your order tomorrow then. Yeah. Well I already I emailed it Ian earlier mm. in the week. <laughs> so, but the um which is actually a funny, funny story is I was late to this podcast because I had my mother's address because of last year I had to get some stuff delivered to my mother. 
And because uh, anyways, long story, but I had her address down and I got a call because I knew it was coming today and I was like, oh, I'm going to be at the warehouse, doesn't matter. But I got a call from the guy and I was driving to this podcast and I was actually in the area and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm here delivering. I was like, oh, no worries, you're at the warehouse. He's like, oh, no, I'm at some residential address. Oh, oh he re- went to the oh, really? previous address. And he, yeah, and then he told me, just like, oh, that's my mum's house. And I just happened to be three minutes away, but I had to make a detour <laughs> back and get it and stuff. So I was late to the podcast because yeah. I was picking up a delivery from you guys. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we're talking about the, the fungus. So the fungus is an extension of the root system. Um, so I'll read the quote again. The mycorrhizas greatly increase the absorptive area of a plant acting as extensions to the root system from the Royal Horticultural Society from the England, as I said before. Um, the thought then is that surely you would be able to reduce over time your application rates to a certain degree. So it's maybe it's a, like a long-term investment there. If you're building up the quality of the soil, in, increasing the root system, maybe over a long period of time you wouldn't need as much product to get the same yeah. result rather than the other way around, needing more and more and more each time. Yeah. Well, generally we'll, we'll get people on the programs like what you do in your business and they'll just use like uh, maintenance rates more so than, than one-off rates. Um, so, you know, some of our products might be 40 litres a hectare and they're using them at 10 and 20 litres a hectare um, in their maintenance rates um, just to, you know, you don't want the big spikes and troughs. You just want it to be nice, even flat curve, flat lining. Um, so that's, yeah, 100%, you know, would be part of that story that you don't need to use them at full rate all the time, just low rates more frequently uh, or not more frequently but lower rates regularly um, to, to maintain the healthy plant, yeah, and the healthy soil for that matter, yeah. What about with – so with the product applications and you're, you're bundling them together, is there a certain point where – like you've used too much product, you're not actually going to get a return on investment there? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think sometimes people challenge how many they can fit into a tank on, on not just our products, any. Like it's, made, it's amazing over the years the questions you'll get asked where, you know, Luke's rang, using you as an example, um, you know, you've rang, you've missed your phone call, you've you've rang your back and, and you go, what's up, Luke? And, oh, Kev, I was just checking if, you know, product A, B, C, D, E, F, and G can all go in the same tank. And you're sort of like, oh, hold on, let me think about it. And they go, oh, well, I've already done it, mate, anyway. It's all right. You know, like it's, uh, it, it's uh, it, you know, you're missing by 15 minutes. Um, but, yeah, look, it, it is oh, quite scary what people get into a tank. And, again, um, you know, there's, pretty, there's only two products in our um, superior liquid range that aren't compatible, uh, which is the refresh and the reinforce. Um, everything else is pretty much compatible against it. Now, you know, not that you'd want to, but you could put every product except them two in the same tank, but I'd argue you don't need to, right? It'd be, you'd be going, what, what am I doing here? Um, so again, well, it's, it's the- picking situations for what you'd be using each product for, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they, they kind of overlap a lot of the time, a lot of the products, Correct. you know, like, we, yeah. you know, you got this certain iron and that certain iron and maybe one iron's yeah. got a little bit of manganese and one doesn't or whatever it is or magnesium or, yeah. you know, nitrogen or something so but yeah. then back to what you're saying with the soil testing as well um do you do the soil testing through living turf yeah, how do you do a soil yeah. test what does it cost yeah, yeah. um so yeah soil, soil testing in terms of chemistry soil testing in terms of ph and the basic soil test you know there's a thousand people doing but we certainly do them as well um look off the top of my head i think it's 140 dollars. i think somewhere around that mark to do them right um and then and then you can go into um you know the testing of the microbials and it gets a bit more technical in terms you have to you know have them chilled and packaged properly and all that sort of stuff to get them to labs and it's a bit more in, involved and has to go to a certain lab um it generally takes a bit more time for them to come back because they've got to sit there with you know microscopes and go through and do counts and all that sort of stuff. So I honestly couldn't tell you what they are, but they get into the hundreds of dollars, those ones. But yeah, general soil test that is available, um, as I said, probably for you know, less than $150 tops, I'd say they're around that mark, um, which will give you, you know, pH, all your all your elements, um, which, you know, is quite often what we do for golf courses, sports fields, things like that. Yeah. Some homeowners, they get keen at the start of the season so they know exactly where they're placed and then know what they have to put in and conversely also know what they don't have to put in, you know. So um, any any remediation work they might be needing to do, 
Um, but yeah, all that stuff can be done. You know, we we do all sorts of testing, water testing, you know, nematode testing. Um, you, you name it. There's there's so many tests. It's it's not funny. Yeah. I was maybe I should do that because like 140 bucks per residential client's a lot of money, and probably yeah, correct if you're and happy I'd, with I'd the probably... color. Yeah, because you're saving. I'd... If you reduce your application rate on a 100 square meter lot by 10, percent it's not saving you yeah, any no yeah, spoil of money. But if you've yeah. got like our school is 1700, so 17,000 square meters, almost two hectares. So application yeah. rates are in the thousands. If you're you know talking over the course of the year, and saving that by 10 percent might be a thousand dollars or 700 dollars over the year. So a 140 dollar investment would actually get you a good return. Yeah. But I've never done that, so. There we go. Yeah, I would. I, I would argue that a home lawn. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that burn a lot of money on their home lawns and got good, good on them. You know, um, you know, but, especially um, for you, <laughs> helps you well, out a bit. <laughs> mate, look, I'll be honest. I, I think I've soil tested my lawn uh, once in the 20 years I've been here. You know, just to just to see where it's at. Um, I guess the argument for a home lawn person is 140 dollars probably pays. You know, if you're doing it yourself, $140 probably pays for a few bags of fertilizer and a bit of, you know, wedding agent type thing a year. You know what I mean? So um, I guess you would go to a soil testing in that situation if something's not working or you're not getting results and you're trying to do a bit more uh, problem solving um, and go from there. Whereas in a, you know, commercial slash professional type world, they're using it at the start of each year to do their programming. Um, so they know exactly what they've got, exactly what they need. And as you say, if they don't need phosphorus, why spend X amount of dollars in phosphorus for the year if they don't need it, you know? Um, yeah. So it um, could be something else. Um, you know, it could be people monitoring pHs on on recycled water inputs or something like that that they're, they're looking at to, to manage it. So um, could be looking at sodium salts in their soil for, again, for golf greens that's using dam water or something, you know? So there's, there's reasons why they will do it. Um, I agree in a home lawn situation, um, it's still good, don't get me wrong, but it might be an overkill in some of those in some of those things um, when you can spend the money on something else that might get you the result you need. Talk about the pH as well. I, this came up before when we were talking about the um, water. You were saying that you can get these little like, little stick readers. Yeah, li- um, li- 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 uh, oh, the electronic ones? Yeah, look. Because we, we you- use the... I mean, no, it's not. We use the Manutech. Um, you can get it from Buddies, you can get it from Strata Green, um, kind of like soil pH, where you mix it with the soil, you have the dye, yeah. everything. I know the one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of like it, it's, in my sense, that's a professional standard, you know, but you also have yeah. those little spikes that you can put in that cost you 15 bucks or something like that. My yeah. assumption has always been that they're rubbish. So I've never yeah, bought one and tried it. Yeah. Is there ones that are maybe more expensive that work because what I find is with contractors, if there was one that was say 200 bucks, it would be, but it worked really well. You would buy it, you'd put it in your car and then you could just whip it out and put it down and you would actually test the pH. But yeah. what I find is because the Manutech one, you know, we have to Takes mix a bit of the time. soil. Yeah. It just goes, even though it's in the car and it really is three minutes, you know, or five minutes, you just go, ah, oh, it can't be stuffed. Especially if you're running behind. Yeah. Um, the answer is I'm sure there is. I just don't know them off. The, like the, I okay. wouldn't be able to tell you a brand. But there, there's certainly, you know, those top ones out there. used to be one you'd stick in the ground that would do moisture and pH. Um, I could not for the life of you tell you what it what its brand's name is. Um, but those ones you get where you mix up, I think, the the, the powder and the, you know. Mate, they're, they're, they're quite accurate for the general home gardener. Um, mm. they're, they're mm. probably they're probably one of the better ones of the cheaper formulations, if that makes sense. Um, the downside is, yes, you got to spend a couple of minutes just mixing them up um, and go through. But I've got one of them at home, and I was actually r- remarkably impressed how close it was to what the lab came back with, um, which was good to know. Um, but yeah, it's just to get a general idea of where you're at. Um, and, yeah, you're you not know, trying to get like program. the exact percentage point, but it's like, yeah, oh, it's alkaline, yeah. it's acidic, it's neutral. Yeah. Or... yeah. Um, and then base your program around, you know, around what you find from that if if, if you are that way inclined, I guess. Yeah. I found one on um, Strata Green, which is like a more horticultural of a place, but 250 bucks. 
Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it works or not. But maybe I'll do some more research. Maybe I should do some testing and do some videoing. What do you reckon? Yeah. It'd be interesting to uh, to get a few and put them side by side, testing the same soil and see uh, see yeah. how you know how big a variance you get between the between the different units. So there used to be one that was quite common. It was oh, it's probably you know six or eight inches long. It was like a cone shape. You used to stick it in the ground. It had a button and it had a it had an analog reader on the top um, that me- yeah, measured moisture and pH. Is that the one you're I looking at? What, yeah, yeah. It's a it seems Japanese. Now, yeah, I, I was not- going to say they're. They're either made in Japan or that's that's probably the same one I'm talking. Yep, that's it. That? That's the one. There you go. Yep, that's so the two, one. they're 250 yep. bucks. Now, yep. what, so tell me your experience with this because um, we um, we're doing some stuff with Strata Green for the horticultural side of it, the lawn side of it, and uh, you know what? I don't know much about them, so I don't want to be like. Yeah. Uh, no, that's all right. I, I go um, get this. It could be rubbish. Uh, that's right. exactly that's the exact unit that we used to use. You know. Back in the day, um, you know, keeping in mind twenty something years ago since I was been in the field, but um, every day. But yeah, that they were used to be a pretty good indicator of what they do. From memory, from memory, there was like a catalyst. You had to have a certain amount of moisture in the reading okay. before they would be accurate on the pH. If that made sense. So, if the soil was too dry, you couldn't then have an accurate pH reading. Um, so yeah, so again, I don't know enough about them, but that was the unit that used to be always the sort of. The norm that people had in their back pocket or in the shed, um, but as I said, these days there's so many different, um, there's so many electric units. Are, yeah, and that and that's the pH one, the the, the yeah. test. Yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. I had a quick look on the lawn shed to see. I mean, we might have a chat with Ian, but if you type in pH on the lawn shed, um, it comes up with the lime, but um, maybe he does have a pH reader. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I honestly don't know. I, I don't think we do, but um, but as I said, there's I'm sure there's some that someone will be able to comment that there's a, a really good unit. Um, you know, some of the units we do in the golf market do different things, but they're thousands of dollars, you know, which the average yeah. person's not going to want. Um, but like that that unit you just showed, the beauty of that is that's the type of unit, you know, when I worked for a company that we did commercial, um, sorry, lawn consults, that's exactly what I had, and it was easy because you could walk around, stick it in three or four spots in the lawn, test it, and uh, you know see any anomalies that were there straight away with um, with pH, and then you then you would go down the path of saying, look, I think your pH is high or low. Um, you know, we should do some further investigation. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, two hundred fifty bucks is. I'll do some testing on it. I'll see. I'll see if it's any yeah. good. But yeah. Takamura soil pH yeah, moisture meter. It was funny because I was going to say I remember they were you know Japanese or Chinese made or something and that that's exactly it yeah yep. So it's funny if you have a Japanese name on something it sounds really professional like and good yep. and you have a Chinese name on something and you get really suspicious and they're like next door neighbors. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like if that's... this is called if this is called something uh, Takamura sounds good. If it was a Western name, I'd probably be a little bit more suspicious. Like the Japanese name to me is like oh it must be good. It's Japanese. Yeah, I'd, but it might be rubbish. I don't know. <laughs> It's like your geography lessons today. Yeah. <laughs> well, mate, do you know what? We're almost at an hour and a half, believe it or not. Yep. So let's finish with this then. Before we, we wrap up, is there a product that is game changer in your world that we haven't talked about? And people getting oh, this far geez. into this, they, they want to know this sort of stuff. Then no one has gotten this far into this type of podcast and they're not wanting to know the secret goss on the new stuff coming out and all the all the stuff that you think's underrated. We've touched on a lot of stuff, but is there anything we haven't touched on enough that you would recommend? Anything new that you've been getting excited about? That kind of stuff. Um I, I think one of the you know, it's stuff we haven't talked about is chemistry. Um so you know, I think these days it's just getting on to the products, the pre-emergence, you know, the, the, the protective insecticides, those type of things. Like there's so many things you can do now before you have the problem, um, whereas once upon a time it was always a reactive world. Today you can be a preventative world. Um, so I think that's a big change in people's mindsets and it's still a big change to get that in people's mindsets. It's still amazing how hard it is to sell a pre-emergent herbicide, um, even in, the, in my world, because people still don't get that there's no weeds here. Why would I spray? But then three months later, there's weeds everywhere. So, you know, I don't think it's a game changer, but I just think it's something if you're not on those type of programs to, to get on the programs, um, you know, plant growth regulators, a huge product. Um, again, it can just, 
bring your turf to the next level. Um, you know, even mentioned about the plant growth regulator for hedges at your podcast the other week that I was at, and you know, it was amazing how many yeah. people didn't even know there was there was that was available. You know, um, so again, they're probably not game changers, but they're products that um, you know that I think there's a lot of people using them. But there's a lot of people that aren't using them that are missing out. Um, you know, you've mentioned barricade numerous times on your podcast. Yeah. You know, you've only got to use barricade for a season or two, and 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 and, and or any other pre-emergent for that matter, and you'll see the results. Um, you know, in a couple of seasons, how much less weed material you have in a pl- person's garden or lawn, depending which product you're using. Um, so yeah, so I just think it's just you know just don't uh, you know <laughs> as much as I hate saying this, don't believe everything you read online. Like it's um. You know, speak to someone that's got a bit of knowledge or someone that's used them. Um, there's so many opinions, or I don't think it's this, or I think it's that. On uh, you know, I, I'd like to see what the people's pro- professional indemnity insurance is like on some of these podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, the po- yeah, the posts that people are posting. Um, yeah. You know, I saw one the other day that you know, I, I I I sort of knew what it was, but I just was interested in the twenty or thirty posts after it was. Oh, it's dollar spot. It's grubs. It's this. Do that. Do that. You know, and not not one was oh, right. Man. You think, well, like, you know, like if they'd done every bit of, you know, it's almost like, I wonder if the same's there. You know, not that I'm classing us as doctors, but you know, I wonder if people take photos of something on their arm and ask someone what it is, and you know, get professional advice from that sort of methodology. Um, so yeah, just just you know, do a bit of research. You know, first of all, find out what it is, and then treat it. You know, um, and don't just you know the old story oh it's grubs oh it's dollar spot you know like it's it's not usually that's not what it is if you know what i mean um and um it's quite um, quite interesting how many people think it is it's a lack of it's a lack of like pause in some of these comments that really gets me because yeah. like tomorrow will be our 11th year anniversary of the business right nice and i've been working in the field since i was 15 in a paid capacity and I second guess myself all the time. And, Correct. Yeah. You know the 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 Brisbane podcast live podcast isn't out yet, but you know Matt Oliver from Suncorp Stadium, who their team won at at Asthma, uh, uh, the Australian yeah. Sports Turf Association, like yeah. the the best team grounds team for the year or something like yeah. that. You know, a, a le- yeah. legit award. And he's he's running that. And he talked about how he was last year going back to the books and double checking himself. And it's like the, the more people have experience in the industry, the more they kind of realize it's complicated. But then some of the people in these groups who are homos who just got into whatever, they just go out and they're just telling you stuff. And it's almost like that is a sign of someone who you shouldn't listen to is someone who's that <laughs> quick to give you an yeah. answer. You know, a lot of yeah. the time, that, you know, not on, the, on basic questions yet, but a lot of the time the people who are experts actually – they come back and they ask you questions and there's a lot more going on to the answer yeah, and it's correct. not a quick phone call like you think it is but then yeah. you go online and it's like oh it's this for sure and put down this and do this and do that and sometimes yeah. they're right but it is interesting when they're not we are, we have a bit of a uh, a bit of an analogy mate we, we say seek to understand right so the first thing i'm going to do is ask questions to try and get an understanding of what you've done what happened you know there's so many posts you see that people put up and you go well, how long has it been there oh i don't know a week you know, and then you find out it's been there three months. Like, what have you put out the last couple of weeks? What have you done? You know, yeah. um, there was one. There was one the other week I saw, and it was you know it was pretty obvious that someone had um, transferred herbicide across the lawn. But you know, all the different answers were quite laughable, I guess, when you sort of look at yeah. them. But yeah, you have to. It's what I said before. If you get a herbicide that hasn't worked or a product that hasn't worked, you know, ninety five percent of it's not the product. It's usually the person or the application or the methodology. Um, and you have to ask the questions. You know, what nozzles did you use? How much water did you use? What was your mixing rate? Um, yeah, I was at a. I was at what a. What was the weather? The day. Did what it rain three minutes yeah. after you pulled it down? Yeah, Correct. exactly. Um, it's quite scary, Luke. I was at. You know, not to be rude to anyone in particular, but I was at a, a thing the other day where people were talking about. Um, you know, we did a bit of a seminar myself and Ian actually, and I asked the question: How many people? Like, put your hand up if you know the size of your area. Um, and then know your calibration of your of your machine, and it was quite scary how many people were able to leave their hand up, <laughs> and um, and like I just sort of made the comment, and is but yet you'll all ring me and abuse us that the product hasn't worked when you don't know the basic you know basic 
the, you know, the old triangle, the basic parts of the triangle before you start. So, yeah, just, you know, yeah, I guess it's well, not, not having I, to dig anyone. It's, it's, it happens in all worlds, but just, you know, mate, some of the best things I see is on the comments that people make that, you know, read the label. I don't think it's people being smart asses. It's just that the information's in the label. Read it, you know. Um, I see it on a car forum, mate. You know, someone will have, what's this dashboard light on my car that's flashing? And someone goes, it's in the manual, you know, like it's read the manual. Um, people just looking for a quick answer. Um, but, yeah, just just check it out and don't always believe everything that's online. And, and um, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of professionals wherever area in Australia are that can, can have a look or, you know, send photos. And when you send photos, I asked this the other day, don't send a photo that's, you know, looking from tw- 20 metres back with a photo that when you zoom in or pixelate, you need to have good, good clean photos, close-ups, a pen or keys or something. So you can see the scale of it, all that sort of thing. And, and, you know, anyone in their right mind will ask you questions, as you said, to try and get to the bottom to find you a solution. Sometimes there may not be a problem found, but there can be some you know, possible solutions that hopefully will we'll, we'll get an answer or, or get a result more than an answer. Um, but that's why we have labs and tests and disease testing and MSO testing and soil testing and things like that to um, sometimes quantify our thoughts, you know. Um, you know, our company has, I think we've got 11 people in New South Wales, so quite often we'll put things in our internal group post. Has anyone seen this or anyone got an idea what this might be? Um, you know, I don't see myself as an expert, but I know plenty of people that are. So, you know, it, um, there's always someone you've got that's got a lot of knowledge to, to chase down and track down information and, and ask their opinion or get them to a site to ask an opinion, yeah. And it complements each other as well. When you've got a team of people with different backgrounds and experiences and all that sort of stuff, you know, it, they, yeah, the sum of the parts is greater than the, is that the, I've, I've stuffed up that yeah, saying, I, but that's all yeah. right. Know, the sum of the parts are greater yeah. than the cheesecake that you bought from the yeah. shop down the road. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, mate, that, I reckon it's a good place to end. Uh, people, if you want to contact Kevin, I don't know, where do I, where do I put your details? Uh, Do you want well, your phone number on the internet? <laughs> probably not. It already is. But living on our website, livingturf.com.au is obviously uh, for the Living Turf side of the business. Um, obviously, if it's residential people, the launchhead.com.au, which will go through to Ian. And then the trade that's in between, that's the living, sorry, is the launchhedtrade.com.au. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, um, what people don't realize, when they go on the Lawn Shed, if you go on the Lawn Shed, sign up for a Shed account, say you heard everything through the podcast, and it opens up more products. So if you've gone on the Lawn Shed in the past and been like, oh, there's not that many products, that's because that's targeted to homeowners and they don't you know, have as many needs. But if you get a trade account, it shows you more products that are available for people who are professionals. Correct. I think there's also a lot more um, support in the trade side as well for program exactly what we've been talking about for programming and products and costings and all that sort of stuff. There's a lot more, a um, lot more of that available to help the help the professionals out into their sales, into their uh, into their customers. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it's, that's what's there for. And I feel like that's why that's why I like it as a an option because when you have a simple question uh, from a residential person, yeah, you can get a simple answer, but yeah, often we have real technical questions and uh, are a lot more nervous about something because we're applying it as we're charging it. And you know, that's the support that's good there. And so I yeah, guess yeah. if you're um, people, if you have more questions for Ian, ask uh, Ian, if you have questions for Ian, <laughs> ask him as well. Yeah, ask I mean, Ian. If, Ian's, Ian's a much better bloke. I'd ask Ian too. If you ask, you have questions for Kevin, ask Ian. He can't be stopped. Yeah, that's right. Kevin's yeah. too busy. He doesn't care. Yeah. Give his phone number. Do you want me to give his phone number? Yeah. Oh, let's read it out right now. Uh, it is. <laughs> no. Um, but no, if you uh, have questions, jump on Living Turf and uh, send them to Kevin's way. And uh, Kevin, thank you for coming on the podcast. Everybody else, thanks I'll for see you. <laughs> Haven't you? I was going to say thanks for finally inviting me. Yeah, after all this time, uh, you know? No, I invited you months ago. <laughs> he's, he's he's being rude, people. Actually, don't yeah. even contact him anymore. Don't don't <laughs> don't talk to him. All right, mate. Uh, see you later. Thanks, mate. Take care, Luke. See you, mate.